Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Um, this is a schmooze day, which means that we don't know what we're going to talk about until we all get together. Today, I'm going to talk with my old friend, Bryden Gombe. Hello, Bryden. How are you? Hello, Meta. I am very well. Hello, Marty Klein. How are you? Hi, Meta. Glad huh? to see you. Oh, I should introduce all of you, both of you. Uh, Bryden is a, a, a retired community psychologist and very much of an activist. Uh, I, was, I got acquainted with her in Science for Peace about 30 some years ago. And, uh, and Martin Klein is a retired professor of African history at the University of Toronto. I, th I know that both of you spent time in Africa. What's up with you? Well, uh, right now it's breaking in a new washing machine. <laughs> but, uh, kinds. I just, uh, I was involved with a young man from Cameroon who was really quite brilliant, who just landed a job at UQAM. And, oh, good. and UQAM uh, is really supporting him. Uh, uh, but he's bringing students, and he's bringing students in from his native Cameroon and from Senegal. And, and Senegal is very interesting in a lot of ways because there are several diasporas and one is a, an academic diaspora. Uh, Senegal is producing fine young scholars. Africa is, in spite of all the problems of funding education, of large classes, uh, uh, lar large classes all the way up. I mean, I think one of the problems in higher education is sometimes inadequacies in primary education. One of the things that made, made Toronto, uh, uh, University of Toronto a good school system, I think is we built on, on a, a strong tradition of primary education. Hmm. And, and I, one of the things I came to believe is is that if you want to produce outstanding intellectuals, you start in the first grade. In fact, it may start even earlier, and okay. and and which means you have to respect the people, the teachers. Uganda's mostly, if they speak any foreign languages, it would be English, right? Yeah, but in in uh, in West Africa, is it most likely to be French? Marty? You know, it depends on where you are. The biggest yeah. country in West Africa has more people than all the rest combined. And, and its official language is English. Though, though the, the languages people actually speak are very diverse. Okay, now you've got me guessing. I can't, I can't imagine which country has more people than all the others combined. It's Nigeria. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. One of the things that's happened is happening all over the world, and, and this is, it could be another interesting subject to get into, is that the rate of reproduction is going down. And the more we educate women, the faster it goes down. And that's true in Africa, too? Oh, it's yeah. True. It's true in Africa, too, though there are countries, Nigeria still has a rate of reproduction. Uh, many Africa, India, is down to almost 2.1. You know what I mean? 2.1 is uh, 2.1 uh, children per woman. Yeah. Per mm -hmm. woman. That's and, terrible. And that's, <laughs> that's certainly better than the, used to be six or eight, I think. Well, you know, the, the, you, the uh, 40 or 50 years ago, I don't remember when the people like Paul Ehrlich, the exact dates, of people, the the projection was of a of a disaster. But yeah, in I fact, I, I bought uh, about a hundred copies of a book called *The Population Bomb* and sent it to all my friends <laughs> for Christmas. So yes, I remember Paul Ehrlich and his misplaced uh, projections. But what what happens is is uh, birth control and abortion the legalization of abortion and and uh and so that we have a, a most developed countries 
have a rate of reproduction of, of, of 1.3 to 1.5. And, uh, and that's partly people who, who don't have children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's partly people who don't get married. My son's in his 50s. He, he's actually sharing an apartment with a, with a woman. Um, I, but he's, he's never married. He has no intention of getting married. Mm-hmm. And he's not interested in having children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it goes global. I mean, China overdid it. Yes. Their methods were very coercive. And, and I understand the logic because the rate of reproduction was quite high. And, and f- f- families uh, were not happy. I, mean, I, had a gr- my, I had a Chinese graduate student who was able to get his wife into Canada and into a degree program in library science. And uh, they had two children. And they were able to do it because they lived in, they were living in Canada while he was pursuing his graduate degree. And when they came back with two children, nobody discriminated against him. Uh, I had a very interesting experience of the one child rule. And that was when I was doing a course at York University uh, on refugee issues, because I've been working on refugee issues for about forever. And uh, one part of the course involved um, a a sort of uh, role playing, going down to uh, uh, the immigration place on Victoria Street. And I was put in the in the uh, position of having to defend as a Chinese a uh, refugee arriving in Canada, having to account for my presence in Canada because I had had a hidden child, if not two hidden children, in, uh, in China. And what I found so interesting about the experience was that as a fluent, as a highly educated, fluent English speaker, knowing in advance what I was going to be facing, when I saw somebody up on a podium judging me uh, and lawyers arguing against me, I got quite confused. And I, I mixed up part of my story where I had hidden a child with a relation in another town. And it was, I have found it a very interesting experience because it gave me a deep sense of what it must be like to be in that position when your life really depends on it. Oh. And, uh, and you don't speak the language and you don't know the customs and you do see a real person in authority making a decision about your life. Uh, it was a very, very interesting part of the course. The rest was academic, but that really stays with me now. You know, I've had that experience too, quite a different kind of situation, uh, but it, it reminded me of something, um, you know, I, I used to know a lot of people who'd been conscientious objectors who during World War II basically, well, either they were in prison or they had to do the equivalent of uh, hard labor with prison right. and so on. So there was a, they were treated as felons and they said they felt guilty, even though, in fact, of course, it was out of their extreme conscientiousness that they were refusing to go to war. They refused to fight, but because it was big principle for them. So they should have felt virtuous. But it is true. If you're in a situation where people are looking at you as potentially a culpable uh, you know, person, it, it's almost impossible to avoid feeling that way. I, I was deported from the Soviet Union and I had, uh, they, they put me back on, a, on the very plane that I'd been brought in on because they wouldn't let me in the country. And uh, here was a plane full of people uh, aware that they, the flight was being held up 
so that I could be put back on this plane. And when I got back on, uh, of course, they all thought that I was some sort of felon. And uh, the yeah. whole trip, you know, I, I was so humiliated, you know, even though, in fact, I had gone back fully expecting to be deported because I knew that they, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been hanging out with the dissidents and they didn't like that. So the, it is true. You know, you, if you are seen as a, a guilty person, you feel shame no matter what. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very interesting. Right now I'm reading the memoirs of Ai Weiwei. And it's so interesting to read later on as he becomes so much more of an activist mm -hmm. uh, and his whole experience, including um, the whole one child policy. I, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating book if you want to find an interesting book. But I was thinking back, one of the things I do occasionally is help uh, with translation thinking back to what Martin was saying about um, uh, uh, Senegal, uh, uh, sometimes I help a little bit with translation, the French English part um, for people who are in the detention center here. And uh, that made me think, and of course I, I knew about Nigeria having lived in Uganda, but um, in Uganda, which is a really small country, there are 40 different languages, 40. And it's, I, I don't know the size, Martin, do you know the size of Uganda? Would it compare with a New Brunswick here in size, maybe? No, I think it's a little larger than New Brunswick, but, uh, but, but not, uh, huge. Not, not that huge. much. No. It's not as big as Ontario or Quebec. Right. But 40 languages is an awful lot. And I remember talking to the students there. And of course, they all had to speak good English. And I think of some of the attitudes we come across here where people uh, don't see uh, people from other countries quite as well as they might. And I think so many speak more languages than you might know. We had a traveling, students did in the, in the holidays, they had a traveling theater and they went uh, all around the country. And I remember speaking to one of them and asking him, did he understand? You know, I know there are Bantu, there are certain language groups that are quite similar, but others that are quite different. And I asked him, do you understand when you're acting in a Choli in another part of the province where the language, do you understand that? their language. And he said, not at all. We have to learn all these plays by heart in the different languages so that we can perform them. So that's just provinces in a, not a huge country. So I find often the people who come here can just run rings. They may not speak English so well, but they can run rings about us in Many other well, different just, languages. Are, they, are, are there primary schools uh, teaching? I, for instance, if you were in primary school in a village, you would be lucky to be at school in certain areas. You would be lucky to be at school at all. The ones that would be directing you towards uh, ongoing education were taught in English. And so children immediately had to, when they started school, they had to learn English. Well, do they have different scripts? But that is a long time ago. I don't know about now. The Senegal is French. Yes. It is, or that is the school. Congo, too. I mean, there are a and, number. And, and the people who go on speak French very well. Mm -hmm. the people who have only four or five years of, of education and then drop out and become peasants or workers. I've, I've been in villages where young men want to talk to me because they want to practice their French because yeah. they don't yeah. speak French in the village. They speak the local language. Right. Senegal is lucky because there is one lingua franca that is, and I don't know whether it's true. I'm, I'm re reading a book right now uh, on Swahili. And, and Swahili is the only African 
well, I guess Amharic in Ethiopia, uh, a national language. Hmm. So, if you how much look, of Africa uh, is covered by uh, you know people speaking Swahili? Uh, if you just look geographically, what fraction of the about a hundred million people, maybe a little more. How many? But I I have had the experience of translating for a Luganda speaker. Uh, of what was said by a Swahili speaker. And those are two languages that are very similar. Uh, but the Luganda speaker claimed not to understand Swahili. And that was a prejudice associated with the slave trade. So the Swahili speakers in that part of Uganda were associated with having taken part in the slave trade. So mm -hmm. she claimed she could not understand a word of Swahili. So I was the one who was the translator, which was quite funny because um, neither my Swahili nor my Luganda was top notch. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Uganda, was, what, what language did you, if you interacted with local people, what language? Was it usually in English or? Yes, it was mostly in English and mostly in Kampala, people went to school in English. So it was out in the countryside that sometimes one used a bit of Swahili because the language in the part we lived in, Makerere, uh, uh, Kampala, that was the language was Luganda. And further north, people wouldn't have understood Luganda. So then it was a matter of finding somebody who could speak English. What fraction of the uh, population or the territory? I, I can't give an estimate, but I could describe the area. Okay. Uh, it would be Tanzania, um, uh, the Eastern Congo, uh, probably Rwanda and, and Burundi and a large part of Kenya. Yeah. And I would think a part of Uganda. Mm -hmm. Did you try maybe, maybe, no, maybe even part of northern Mozambique. You didn't need to learn it uh, working in Senegal. No. Uh -huh. there, there's no, the second most widely spoken language in Africa is Hausa. And, uh, but Hausa is, there's, there's a large zone in, in, in which the houses House of Traders dominated trade. So that in, in, in Kumasi, for example, which is uh, the second city of Ghana, uh, the, the language people speak to each other in is Hausa. Mm. That is, a, the, 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 because of the importance of trade, Hausa became the everyday language. Uh, and you know, Senegal it had, is dominated by a local language, by Wolof. Do they have a, a separate script? There, there have been, there is a script uh, um, uh, called Inco, and there are people trying to, to revive it and expand it. There are people who write in uh, using Arabic letters, and there are people who write African languages using uh, Roman letters. It, it all depends on whether you have missionaries, mm -hmm. <laughs> which language the missionaries spoke. Okay. So that when, you know, for example, one of the sources, the, the, the rulers of, of the small kingdoms in Senegal always kept, uh, uh, always had a Muslim scribe, a Muslim who, the, he was the king's uh, priest, the king's marabou. And, and he not only prayed for the king, but he handled correspondence. So the French to deal with African kingdoms had to maintain uh, an, an Arabic interpreter. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've gone through the files and, and I've actually used some of these sources. Hmm. So that there's, there's uh, when, when things get, start getting written down, uh, uh, they get written down first in Arabic. And, uh, but then with the 
the, the French are, were interested in people learning French. And, and that's been a, an important factor even today, that the emphasis, the, the French, you know, everything, people have stereotypes of French, but I think, I think what's striking about the French is the importance of language, the importance of their language, not just in Quebec, but in, in France itself. Mm-hmm. You know, I was recently looking at the uh, official languages at the UN, and I gather that only, uh, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, Arabic was added to the others. Um, and apparently the some uh, Middle Eastern countries had to promise to pay the bills that it was it was going to be a, an added expense to make Arabic into one of the official UN languages. Um, so at the time I, I, I looked at the list, so of course there's Chinese, but uh, the, 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 um, the thing that occurred to me is maybe th- there wasn't any African language that was official. And I began to think, well, if you were going to add one, which would it be? And I figured probably Swahili. Yeah. But then I thought, you know, as far as I could figure out, it would be less than half of Africa that would be even familiar with uh, Swahili. So oh, it, it, there's it, it, no particular reason for a, an African language except just uh, the sense of justice, to be fair to Africa. <clears throat> what, what's interesting about Swahili is the diaspora has picked up on Swahili. Some of it is the is the in, impacts, in some ways, indirect of Julius Nyerere. I mean, he's really one of the few great leaders yeah. of the founding. He was a man of of intellect and moral sensibility, uh, and 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 vision. And not all of his vision worked out. Uh, though, I, though when he died, I asked my friend Jerry Heliner, our friend Jerry Heliner, who had spent uh, a couple of years in Tanzania, uh, if, what he thought the long-range impact was. Because I think sometimes leaders uh, who, who, who have, a, I don't know what it put, a moral impact, uh, leave behind ideals. Now, right now, it doesn't look it doesn't look like the current president is uh, very committed to Nira's ideals, but I, I think they're there. You know, I remember a man in the late '60s, a very tall, very distinguished black guy, long face, with a, wore white and a white uh, fez or kind of thing. I think he was Nigerian, I don't know, but I heard him speak and he just dazzled me, but I believe he was murdered. And I can't recall who he was. And I think he was Nigerian, but it, it you know, I, I'm not sure. Do you know who I'm talking about? Somebody no. who would have been impressive anywhere. No, I, I, but I've known people. We, uh, one of my friends. Uh, is, this guy was the head of a country though. He was a president. Yeah. Do you know who I'm, I might be talking about? We're white. Brighton, do you know who I mean? The guy, I'm trying to think, uh, the guy who was shot, the plane was shot down. I'm trying to, uh, there was a leader whose plane, who was killed when the plane was shot down. And well, I'm that, trying that to would, think. That would be, that? A, it could have been Samora Michelle, but that's South Africa. No, I'm thinking of someone else. A Nigerian. Hmm. Okay. No, I'm not saying no. A smaller country, and uh... didn't Senegal also have a very distinguished writer as, as yes, a the first the Senghor, uh, the first president yeah. of, Se- of Senegal, oh. yeah, was Leopold Sadar Senghor, and he was he had a a, a, a degree which <laughs> he was a grammarian. Oh. Is, he was an agrégé en grammaire, and the aggregation is a degree which we don't have in English. It involves mastery of a field, and and most agrégé teach in high schools in, unless they move into uh, uh, doing research. 
and and he he was teaching French uh, in in a French high school, and he got involved in Senegalese politics. He he had to relearn. He wasn't uh, well off himself, and and some of my friends used to talk about how poor his wall off was <laughs> though they didn't like him so <laughs> that, that, that may be a political judgment but he he's also one of the first african presidents to retire he spent 20 years as president and and was a deputy in the french parliament before that and after he retired he was elected to the academy francaise which is about as distinguished uh an intellectual position as one could have. And he's, he was a poet. And, and one of the things I did when I first went to Senegal, one of the things I do when I go to new places, that's, actually I did it when I came to Canada, is I read novels. Because the thing that a novelist does is he, give, he gives you a, he or she, uh, gives you a feeling for the place. Um, and there weren't many, now, now there's some very good ones, and they're, they're movies. Uh, uh, there's a, a movie industry in Senegal. It would be interesting to sort of make a list of really distinguished thinkers that people anywhere in the world should be uh, interested in because they have something very special to contribute, either in political or philosophical or even musical uh, uh, you know, traditions. Um, if you were to, I mean, you've mentioned Nereri uh, and, uh, and Senghor, uh, and then this, I, I was thinking of this other man that I was so dazzled by, whose name I can't recall. But if you were making such a list of, of people in Africa who have really contributed uh, to ideas that the world should Everybody should share. Let learned people should should uh, try to understand. Who would be on your list? Well, a lot of them would be novelists, uh, um, and at least one is uh, uh, spent. I I don't know if she lives in Nigeria now. Is Chinamanda Adichie? Uh, but I think she lives in the states now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wally Shayenka would. Uh, yeah. Be, uh, in fact, the, the other the, the the novel, which is probably the best introduction to Africa, it, 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 and is has been sold millions of copies, mostly for use in in classes, classrooms, is uh, um, uh, a Chebe's uh, things fall apart. Things fall apart. Yes, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, that's an an essential book. Really? I mean the, the name uh, of the author again because it's not familiar to me. A C H E B E. A C H E B E. Uh, and his first name is Chinua. His daughter teaches at Michigan State University. Oh yeah. <laughs> really? And oh. she's a, a very fine scholar. I mean, there is, uh, uh, but I could, uh, the, the philosophers, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not up on, I, I could give you names, but I, I wouldn't be able to evaluate them. As a political thinker, I'd say uh, and, and Niera. Niera, certainly. Niera, <laughs> uh, and Senghor. Though a lot of Senghor, I, I always felt Senghor uh, was was often adapting his his thinking. Is Senghor was one of the, the leaders of the Negritude movement, and uh, but when he became a, a, a politician. Negritude was very popular in the United States, uh, but not in its own country. <laughs> and, and he developed notions of, the, of francophonie uh, and, and uh, he, he moved in, in a different direction. So he, without, and he's, he's very adept 
I mean, shortly after we arrived in Senegal, he gave a, I don't know, three or four hour speech at the party Congress on revision of the five-year plan. And, and it was really a masterpiece of French rhetoric. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, it, it was just the style. The, the, I, I love to listen to him speak, speak just because he, he was elegant. Uh, there are other people like a Marxist kind of uh, program. What was he, uh, you know, he, he? He he called his party the socialist. He, re, he renamed it as the socialist party, but his socialism was not Marxist at all. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, well, how Very much? Certainly, Mandela would. If you were thinking of philosophy, I would put Mandela up there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so, well, Move, moving south a bit. Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, how much would you say um, the Soviet uh, communist uh, uh, angles on, on Marxism actually have penetrated into the thinking that is uh, current among uh, uh, intellectuals in Africa in general? I, I, I think it was great in the 60s. Yeah. Um, it, it, in, in, I, I can only speak for the French. The French, uh, the, the African intellectuals, in, well, in some ways, I, can, I think with England, the African intellectuals in France uh, found alliances on the left. And, and I think actually the same thing is true in, in, uh, in, in England. The, the influence certainly among the African, uh, the, 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 both the African and the diaspora communities yeah. of people like C.L.R. James, or Walter Rodney, uh, Franz Fanon had influence. We, probably the most distinguished African thinker is uh, Ali Masri. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting for me, when I got back from Senegal, I had a grant from the New Nations Committee at the University of Chicago. And, and one of the head of the committee, the year I was there, uh, was Edward Schills, the distinguished sociologist, and not a very radical figure, mm -hmm. but a person very interested in, in in the history of ideas. And uh, when I arrived, the first question he asked me is, who, who do students admire? Mm. And, and he was particularly interested in the impact of people like Sekou Toure and, and Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, and Nkrumah is a significant figure. Mm. And I said, but they're Francophones. I said, I thought the most popular figure uh, among the young uh, Senegalese intellectual of outside Senegal was Ahmed ben, ben Bella. And it was simply the sense that Ben Bella believed in what he was doing. They were cynical already about Sekou Toure. I mean, Sekou Toure was a... Uh, uh, was popular abroad. He was handsome. He was articulate, uh, uh, but a, a, a friend of mine. I, I was very friendly with a guy who later on became a key figure in Tanzania, named Engobali. And Engobali had re received at had been a Tanu activist in Tanzania, and. And when the British had conceded independence, actually before independence actually took place, but the British agreed to it, uh, he was given a scholarship to Liberia. And be, being a Tanzanian radical, he became persona non grata and spent some time in Guinea uh, before finding his way to Senegal, which was very tolerant of his radical ideas. But his, his phrase that has stuck with me 
for, six, for more than 50 years is you can't make revolution in a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, but then, then we had Masrui as, uh, stayed with us for, uh, uh, for about three months. And, and, and he was quite an exciting mind, but uh, Schill's introduction to him was that he was one of the two best minds in in the in African in the African Revolution, and the other one was Franz Fanon. Well, that's interesting because I was thinking you're dropping all these names and they're totally unfamiliar to me. I haven't read a word of any uh, written by any of them except for Franz Fanon, whom I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, Ali Mazrui was a friend of ours, and I'm still in touch with his wife, uh, who lives in the States. Really? So, yeah. His, his first wife, Molly? Yeah, uh, yes, Molly. How is she? Where is she? Yeah. She, I'm trying to think where she fetched up. She fetched up in one of the um, university towns, um, Hmm, it's kind of northern, central northern. Yeah. Can't think of which state it is now, but we exchange an email from time to time. Well, when I, so I know a bit about what's happening to her, her children too. So uh, their children. I, I'd be interested in what this man had to say because of all the things that we've mentioned so far, nothing rings any bells to me. And it makes me ashamed of myself because, you know, I don't want to be that insular so that I only know Western writers, but really I don't know any African writers. So what does this Missouri have to say that I should listen to? Oh, what well, he's, he's not with us anymore. Well, uh, what did he have to say? And is it, he, is it he was on, worth uh, knowing? The, the reason you know Fanon and not, and not Masruri is that you were at Berkeley at yeah. <laughs> an important stage in your life. Right. And, and uh, the thing, if, if you were, when I was teaching African history, modern African history, I used to end my course with Fanon's uh, 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 Les Dames de la Terre. Uh, the wretched of the earth, uh, and and that was partly because at the end of, of the year, the st students aren't reading very much, and I knew that most of the students in my class at Berkeley had read that book. Mm -hmm. And Masruri uh, became a major, f you know, he he after his. Uh, time with us in Chicago, he, he had uh, a series of important academic position. And at, at the time in Chicago, what was amazing about Masruri is that his reputation had preceded him. This mm -hmm. is very bright. He had just finished his thesis. And, and I think people were looking for outstanding African intellects. Uh, at least progressive people were. Was he a philosopher or a political thinker? He, he's a political uh, theorist by, by training, but he did a bit of everything. He made a, a, a series of films on Africa, and he, he was big on the notion of, of Africa's three traditions, uh, Christian, Muslim, and traditional. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but at the time... You could call um, ask Missouri up and say we're doing a, a conference on terror, and would you like to come and do something? And Missouri would spend two weeks thinking about terror. I mean, that's the advantage of being a theorist; you don't have to go out and do research. You just... <laughs> and 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 then a week later, he'd be doing. Uh, 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 going to a conference on democracy in Africa, mm -hmm. and he'd do, uh, and he could generate he 
it was so fascinating to watch him. And, and we, and, and it was intriguing. In, in 1968, which may have been when you were in Uganda, I'm not, I'm not sure if you were there. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I went to the East African uh, Social Science Conference, which was uh, something run by the, the, there was a single university in, U, in each of Uganda, uh, Kenya and Ten. But they Uganda. got together in those, there was they a big together Every Christmas yeah. they would get together and have a big conference. And the two, Ali was teaching uh, in, uh, <coughs> In, uh, in Uganda, which he eventually had to flee because he was, when, when Idi Amin took over, his friends told him, he was away and, and his friends told him, don't come back. Yeah. And, and had he come back, he probably would not have survived. Uh, but he, he was a very popular figure on campus. He was important enough politically so that it one he 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 picked us up at the airport, or picked me up, uh, and I, though I only spent, I, I I checked in after dinner. I checked into a guest house, and and what fascinated me was the story of the, the president of Uganda at that time was a man named Milton Obote, and the and he was invited to the and Obote. It was not as brutal as some of the people who came after him. No. He was invited to the to the president's presidential palace. You, you may know this story, so correct me if I get it, the details wrong. And he <coughs> he showed up, and most of the cabinet was there, and they chewed him out for three or four hours about because he was critical of the government. And and he wanted a a more democratic regime, and uh, and I thought even then that he was lucky that they just chastised him. Yes, uh, but he, he he spoke his mind, and he was not always fashionable, but he was very popular with the uh, African American intelligentsia. And and partly because he became very involved in in the position of Africa in the world. <coughs> I ha I have a, a a funny story to tell about what must have been a bit later. Obote suddenly said to all the people at the university at McCarry, he wanted to know what the different departments were doing about nation building. So all the different departments separately got together and, you know, discussed what they should say. And they thought long and hard and had lots of talks. Well, the department, and I'm sure political science was one of those, the department the philosophers were in was combined with the Department of Religious Studies. So it was religious studies and philosophy. And they got together and decided they had no idea what they were doing. So everybody else sent in, you know, wrote a lovely account of what they were doing, contributing to nation building. And religious studies and philosophy just didn't answer. And at the end, they were highly praised. I don't know how the other departments were praised, but they were highly praised as a department doing great things for nation building. So mm -hmm. but did, was, did Obote just make it up or had he not read anything that was submitted to him or uh, I can't answer that. Only Obote could answer that, but I, or, you know, it wouldn't have been just Obote, but it was surprising to everyone. Well, I don't know whether they told the others that they didn't submit anything. I think they just thought, thought a bit and decided that wasn't up to them or they couldn't really contribute anything. So uh, there was a lot of laughter in that department afterwards. 
You know, uh, you just mentioned, uh, Marty, that there are three, uh, you know, sort of sections of Africa, the, the Muslim, the Christian, and the traditional. And, you know, I'm think what I was fishing for was the names of some people who are would be considered traditional, but who have something to say that we should listen to. And the, I'm comparing them in my own mind with with the indigenous people of North America now, because now we're on to a moment when people are saying we haven't paid sufficient attention to these people and to their traditions, and we have things to learn from them. And of course, there are many different things that we are now being told we should learn, a lot of them having to do with uh, the way to think of nature and to think of our place in nature and to be respectful to uh, to Mother, Mother Earth. And uh, a number of, um, I guess you could call it philosophical, but, but also practical um, advice about how to do everything from farming to uh, being, you know, what is this about seven or eight generations? You're supposed to look ahead and plan that way. Little maxims and handy uh, thoughts that might keep us uh, steering in the right direction. And although I can think I could probably make a list of things that the that we're to, supposed to learn from the indigenous North Americans, I don't think of anything that I've been told I should learn from the African traditions. So if you were to look for something that we should learn, what would it be? Well, uh, the people who are exploring African knowledge and African learning, and the, the first people were, were often uh, missionaries. The, the, there was a man uh, uh, named Placide Temples, who was a, a Belgian priest in the Congo, who wrote a book, which then got translated, wrote it in French, got translated in English, uh, called Bantu Philosophy. And it, it, it's not an area I've kept up with. Um, I think most of the philosophers, I, 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 I really shouldn't get too specific, but what, it, what Temples focused on was the notion of Ubuntu. A, a Bantu, and it, it's rooted in, in the way Bantu languages construct themselves. So uh, the, there are prefi you have a root, and the root is uh, um, in most Bantu languages, the individual is mu. So, uh, uh, so mu. So, an individual, a Bantu individual, is a mubantu. Okay. Uh, uh, the language is key. So, the Swahili, if you're speaking of the Swahili language, you're speaking of key Swahili. Uh, in, in Luba, it's chi, but it's the same procedure. And Ubuntu is the quality of, 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 being, of being Bantu. And, and, and I, I don't want to get too specific because this is a long time since I've read much of this. Uh, but this notion of, of Ubuntu uh, then got picked up by African American intellectuals who were interested in, and, so, and African intellectuals. I mean, he was originally published by a French publishing house uh, called Présence Africaine, uh, which was founded by a Senegalese who was. Uh, a bit of a was very much a philosopher himself, a man named Ali and Yop. And, 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 but what, what's happening in the 60s, particularly from 65, uh, is, is that there is a core of Afrocentric intellectuals who, who are interested in traditional learning 
uh, my feeling, though I, you know, I've met philosophers, and uh, and uh, though I, I professionally I deal more with uh, Islamic thinkers because uh, Senegal is a very uh, very Muslim country, and there's a significant and there are people who've moved into the academic sphere. Uh, I, I don't think we have any Senegalese at the U of T, but they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Columbia, Harvard, I mean, really first-rate minds. Uh, and, and I think they tend to operate more in, 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 uh, in academic traditions. But, but, but in, in uh, a lot was done in this vein when universities began establishing uh, African, um, Africana studies or African American and, uh, studies uh, programs and departments, uh, uh, a lot of it was concerned with African identity. Afri and a lot of it is very similar to what's happening very now with native people. The ideas may be different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think the, there was a concern with how people conceive of their relations with each other. And, and, uh, and the uh, problem is that for both Christians and uh, yeah, let me stop. For many of these people, criticize many American African Americans will criticize. Uh, will will see these this traditional thinking uh, as, as the true African. But if you talk to a Muslim or a Christian, and and a lot of my students were Christians and were church going, the first thing they did after coming to Toronto is to find a, a, a church which was related to whatever their, not all of them. Do they, of them do they um, do, uh, go to an African Christian church in, in Canada or do they tend to join, the, you know, some uh, go to the, uh, the Catholic or the, uh, the Anglican uh, cathedral or something. My, uh, uh, the acting chair of the history department right now is one of my former students, Nakaniki Musisi, uh, who stayed in Canada. And she attends, I don't know if that's the only church she attends, but she attends the Church of the Redeemer. Okay. On the other hand, when one of my a Ghanaian student who was a Christian uh, died suddenly, uh, I heard, I saw a notice that an Anglican church in North Toronto um, was uh, was uh, holding a memorial service for well, him. I but, attended, and I went, and I was the only white person in the in the church. I attended a huge uh, revival meeting in, uh, well, I don't know, it was out uh, uh, toward, the, toward the airport someplace, uh, you know, Pearson Airport. Uh, I had a friend uh, who was a, a, a Nigerian immigrant, uh, a journalist, and, and, and he uh, invited me to, to their uh, services. And they had invited a a preacher from Africa to come for a revival meeting, which was going to last for uh, uh, like th two or three weeks every night, four hours, I believe. In, uh, and I went to this, this uh, meeting. It was really a very memorable event. Uh, it was the best music I ever heard. It was on the day when uh, they were celebrating the end of SARS up at the um, someplace in, in Downsview, an airport, they had a, a big celebration with a whole bunch of bands that came because the first time they'd been allowed to have a big gathering. And I remember hearing all of these rock bands, but boy, the music at this African church was 10 times better than any of them that night. 
and people were dancing in the aisles and clapping and yeah. and and, and uh, this guy was healing people. And, oh, yeah. it's, you know, quite amazing. So I, I guess it would have been considered a Protestant church. There could have been 500 people there and it went on and on for many, many hours. Um, so I don't know wh- how um, popular that kind of, of, of Christianity is or would that have been considered an unusual? I mean, it certainly wasn't like Church of the Redeemer. I, was not, I can say yeah. that. <laughs> it, 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 that, it, that really fits with what would have been my answer to your original question, which was not would not have been academic at all. And although I'm not in touch in the same way, I would have thought music and dance and storytelling are the ones that indigenous influence is still going out. And that's an example of what what I would have said comes from from, uh, what you were asking about indigenous values. I think those values are very strong and I think they're in the diaspora very much. And I sort of come across, I don't know, things, uh, music groups, who originate in African countries, but are going very strong in North America. So it's not about this, so much about the land. I mean, I think the land certainly was of crucial importance to anybody on it. But I think in terms of the influence now, I would have thought that was would be a big one. Is that true for Muslim Africans? As well, or this this was definitely a Christian uh, congregation, yeah. but it wasn't like any I'd ever uh, witnessed before. Well, Did you it? do have some uh, uh, Muslim. My experience with Islam here is is though there may be Africans present. It, there's not. Uh, I I haven't had much experience with shouting, but Senegalese Islam is very Sufi. And you, you know what Sufism, mm-hmm. uh, and and the most original uh, Senegalese religious thinker is a man who rejected the jihad of the sword for the jihad of the word, and and he, he was, but he he developed a, a tradition which is heavily based on work uh, on uh, prayer. And one of the things, they're called the Murids, and they're also all over. They're, they're all over the United States. They're all over Western Europe. I don't, I don't know if there's a Murid group in Toronto, but I, I, I just haven't seen them. Uh, they sell them. But they, the Murids have a type of music in which uh, you have a PA system and you have four big drums of different size, big, bigger, biggest. And and somebody is chants verses from the Koran where the drummers are keeping up a steady beat. And, And it's absolutely transcending. Sounds it. Yeah. It, it, now, listen, it's, it's we're way over and I've got another meeting I've got to deal with, but I wish I could keep talking to you guys for another hour, but I can't. <laughs> Thank you both. This has been extremely interesting for somebody who's never been to Africa. I tell you, it's the next best thing. Thank you both. Okay. See Thank you. Bye-bye. See okay. you both. Bye. Bye-bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week sometimes more. This is episode 451. You can watch these or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. Eventually, we even post the transcripts there. When you get to the website, look around. We have conversations going on there all the time about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar 
or the name of one of the guest speakers. After you've watched or listened, scroll down and share your own thoughts about the show with the other viewers. This is a place for dialogue, so please join in. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can buy a single copy or subscribe for $20 Canadian per year through PressReader. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser. And in the search bar, enter the word peace. You'll see the cover of the current issue and buttons to click to subscribe.